hymn of the church. Uh, we greet all of you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Certainly glad once again to be in the house of prayer. And we know that we owe all of our praise and honor to God because he is the one that uh, sustains us. I want to uh, deal with uh, the book of Revelation today. I uh, request your prayers in that uh, I believe that we should approach all scripture in humility, but particularly the book of Revelation. However, I don't think that we should shy away from it because it is, in fact, the Word of God. And he's not a God of confusion, and He intended for us to understand uh, His Word. Therefore, we should always depend on the Holy Spirit uh, in its interpretation and proclamation anyway. Revelation chapter 7, reading a few verses from the New King James Version, beginning at verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. That's verses 1 through 4. Moving down to verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's verses 9 through 12 of the 7th chapter of the book of Revelation. What makes uh, the book of Revelation a bit more difficult than uh, some other books is that it is written in apocalyptic literature, prophecy, and letter. And one difficulty is that 
all three of those types of literature or genres does not exist in our time. We have uh, prophecy and letter, but the apocalyptic literature is no longer with us except in the Word of God. The taproot, however, is found in the Old Testament, and we find some apocalyptic literature uh, in books like uh, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and a bit in Zechariah. The rest, as I recall, is here in the book of Revelation. The subject that I want to use today is the servants of God are sealed. The servants of God are sealed. Three points we want to emphasize. The first one, the 144,000, the 144,000. Point number two, the great multitude, the great multitude. And point number three, the church. The church. The setting today in our text precedes Christ's second coming. And the setting is during the Great Tribulation. Some try to identify the 144,000 with the church, but the church will have been taken out of the world prior to the second coming of Jesus our Christ. We find that account in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Jesus talks about that period of time in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. He talks about the coming of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and diverse places. He talks about some of the things that the Jews in particular will go through during the great tribulation period. But then he says, but the end is not yet. In Revelation chapter 6, uh, we saw the opening of the seals. Uh, the first six seals point out the great tragedies that will come upon the earth at the beginning of the tribulation. Chapters 4 through 5, the church is in heaven. The seven seals give us an overall picture of that seven year period uh, in chapter six. Six seals open and we are introduced to the seventh seal which consists of the introduction of the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath which is recorded in chapter eight through nine. Chapter 6 lets us know that God is love. However, come on, his love and his perfection compels him to judge sin and wickedness. People sometimes look at uh, the divine attribute of love and they do not grasp it in its fullness. And they say God is too loving to send us to hell. 
but we have to also realize that he is perfect and his perfection requires him to judge sin. How could he give those that believe in him eternal life, endless existence in his presence and then not give those that reject him equal punishment, if you will, rather than the punishment uh, that the non-believers will receive will be no less than the greatness of the eternal life. In other words, everyone will live somewhere forever after judgment. But the difference is those of us that love the Lord, that believe that he is the Christ and believe in his finished work, that demonstrate this by faith, will live forever in the very presence of the Almighty God. There are some preachers that are preaching now that there is no hell. Let me tell you, there is a hell. Because if you believe there is a heaven, the same word that says there's a hell is inspired and superintended by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 7 lets us know that the gospel will still be preached during the great tribulation and some will be saved. The Holy Spirit will be in the world after his church is gone. The same as he was in the world before Pentecost. You might say, well, Jenkins, what are you going to do with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 that talked about lawlessness is already in the world at work the lawless one, which is Satan, will be revealed after the restrainer, which is the Holy Spirit, has finished his ministry of restraining evil during the church age on earth. But that does not mean because the Holy Spirit no longer restrains evil during the church age that he's no longer in existence. Because he always has been, and he always shall be, because he is God. And the seals are open, and we are introduced to the seventh seal, which consists of the introduction of the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath. As I said before, chapter 6, let us know that God is love. However, his love and his perfection compels him to judge sin and wickedness. Chapter 7 lets us know that the gospel will still be preached during the great tribulation and some will be saved. The Holy Spirit, as I said before, will be in the world after the church is gone, the same as he was in the world before Pentecost. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, the question was raised Back in chapter 6, verse 17, whether anyone would be able to stand or be saved during the great tribulation. Chapter 7 answers that question and two groups of people are mentioned. 
first group that's mentioned is those of Israel who are saved and sealed. That is the 144,000 12 tribes, 12,000 from each tribe. Then, of course, those of all the nations, all who are saved and martyred, is the second group. Four angels were told to withhold judgment on the earth until the servants of God are sealed, verse 3. The seal on the forehead symbolizes protection and ownership. This symbolizes Israel, 12 tribes, 12,000 from each tribe, equaling the 144,000. This is not the church. The church will have already been raptured before the tribulation. Chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Then John saw a multitude from every nation, from every tribe, from all people and language, who are standing before the throne of God and in front of the Lamb, which is God the Father, and the Lamb is Jesus the Christ. Chapter 6, verse 9, as they describe salvation, this is the same group in chapter 6, verse 9, that ascribe salvation to God and the Lamb. And the Word tells us that the 24 elders and the four living, living creatures Join in with the 144,000 and the multitude that no man could number, as they did in chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. The 24 elders, a representative of the church, for they are crowned and they are awarded for their faithfulness. They are distinguished from the living creatures which are angelic beings because nowhere in the scriptures does it say anything about the angels being crowned. But the church, those that believe in the Lord, that are saved by faith, all of our works that according to the judgment seat of Christ that's not done in faith will be burned up as wood, hay, and stubble and we will get no rewards for that. But those things that were done by faith there will be awards for them. Paul says, as he talks about being offered up and finishing his work, he said there will be a crown of life waiting on him in heaven. Not only will there be a crown for the apostle Paul, but there will be crowns for those of us that believe as well and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Those in the book of Hebrews that are described, that have laid aside those things that so easily beset us and that have ran a race according to the instructions that has been given us. 
those that love the Lord and that can sing the old hymn that says I love the Lord and he heard my cry and pitted every throng I found in him a resting place and one hymn writer says that he has made me glad and as the hymn says as long as I live when trouble rise, I'll haste him through his throne. I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. I love the Lord. He bowed his ear and chased my griefs away. And as I reflect on the old hymn that says, Hey, George, the keeper I have. A God to glorify. Yes. And that's reflected not to the Canaan of the earth, but the Canaan which is in heaven, which will be the heavenly abode of those that love the Lord. The two groups, the 144,000 and the great multitude, which would include some Jews that was martyred and came out of the great tribulation and the question was asked who are those and I can hear the elders saying these are those that came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb oh praise his holy name it's a peculiar thing and a mystery how we can say the blood which is red and never use a stain but is the blood that we wash our robes in that bring forth us with robes that signifies the sanctification and the purity but I understand the theology because it was only the blood of the Jesus shed at Calvary, only the blood that allowed us to be covered, only the blood that took away the stain of sin and allowed us to be covered, only the blood that was given by the great high priest that ratified through his death a new covenant based on better promises. I'm glad today as I reflect on the word when he said to the crowd and in essence to all of us he will dry away all of our tears uh, which means uh, the suffering that we encountered upon earth uh, and all of the persecution there will be no more suffering there will be no more dying uh, and we will be able uh, along with the living creatures and the crowd that came out of the great tribulation uh, that wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb uh, praise God throughout an eternity uh, to drink water uh, from the springs of living waters uh, and all of our tears uh, will be wiped away uh, we'll be able to live uh, in a city uh, built on 12 foundations uh, in a city uh, with gates of pearls uh, in a city uh, that has streets uh, made of pure gold uh, yes uh, and there will be joy uh, unspeakable uh, throughout all times uh, and then as I reflect uh, as Revelation says uh, there will be a stream uh, flowing out uh, from the throne of God uh, on either side of the river uh, and the leaves 
Isaac will be good uh, for the healing of the nation. Uh, and that word healing uh, does not necessarily mean uh, when we are healed of a disease. Uh, it really means uh, therapeutic, uh, health giving. Uh, the blood of Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, will keep us uh, alive uh, and healthy. Uh, if you believe it today,